Hello, and welcome to Monster Island Radio, a show where we discuss one of our favourite movie franchises, Godzilla. Each episode, we pick a movie from the series and talk about the highlights, lowlights, and everything in between, and why Godzilla is one of our favourite monsters. Joined by Graham, and today we're going to talk about <laughs> Godzilla versus Mega Gearus. That one, oh, that one indeed. Um, so this film came out in the year two thousand. So surely we're in for a new millennium treat here, right? So here's a reminder of the film for those who have probably only seen it the once. Uh, it opens with footage of Godzilla destroying Japan in search of nuclear energy. As a result, Japan shuts down nuclear energy production and develops a new clean renewable energy source uh, called plasma energy. But this this doesn't stop good old Godzilla feeding off of it. No. So uh, don't ask him what his likes and dislikes are as usual. And it's like just because he doesn't go for the nuclear anymore, doesn't he? There's this, this assumption yeah. that that's all he wants, and it's like you know what? he's got varied taste. Yeah. Our oh, boy. Um, but yeah, so he likes plasma energy too. So they shut that down. <laughs> and they figure the only way to continue energy production Get is rid- to eliminate Godzilla. Which they really would do anyway, right? Like, Well, <clears throat> yeah. Well, I kind of liked the uh, idea that, you know, they were going to live in harmony with him to some extent and just develop plasma energy. I guess so. But, but in, in this movie, this is one of the anti Godzilla movies, isn't it? Because obviously the series flip flops all the time, whether or not he's like an advantageous character or not. I mean, the name of the um, like the G Graspers, they're referred to as the anti Godzilla department. So it's pretty, you know, on its sleeve with that one, I think. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, they make uh, a, a weapon called the Dimension Tide that generates black holes to eliminate Godzilla. When testing the weapon, it creates a wormhole where a creature called Meganula briefly appears, leaving an egg behind, which then hatches thousands of Meganulons. They develop into Meganula, end up feeding off of Godzilla's energy, and inject it into a giant cocoon underwater to create Megagirus. Ooh, okay, right. right. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it's... I watched so it. So this, this, it has, it kind of has threads all over the place, but without really much payoff. Well, I watched it last night in preparation for the recording, Mm. But even so, within your synopsis, I was like, hold on a second, I'm losing track of this. I literally, you know what? I just watched I, it. <laughs> I had to watch it again to actually get that synopsis sort of in place because they don't actually say about shutting down plasma energy. Did they not? Nope. Because I was like, well, they've made plasma energy and then they make the dimension tide out of plasma energy. Right. But it turns out they'd shut down plasma energy because towards the end of the film, they're like, why is he attacking the uh, Science Institute? And it's like, oh, because we're secretly still developing plasma energy. And I was like, oh, okay. right. I have a feeling we watched a very heavily edited version because it already ran quite long. It feels like there's big chunks missing. And that was kind of... I actually found the film quite confusing because of that. I've got an opinion on why it might be confusing. and I don't think it's actually the story per se that's the problem. Mm. Go on then. Um, to get right into it, this film has a classic mediocre movie character problem. Um, oh my god! Like <laughs> I wrote down in my little notes here, I was like, I wrote characters: Kiriko, who cares? Hajime, <laughs> who cares? The boy, who cares? Like th- none of them are memorable. I don't care about any of them. They're just so flat. Mm, they are and, like, totally. Any drama that they have just has no gravity because. You just can't connect with them. You get little tidbits of what they're like and their histories. And mm. it's just sort of like, this is just flavour. I would say that this movie poses to characters quite a lot of interesting problems, but they've got this like weapon that shoots 
black holes or worm holes or whatever um they've got this creature that's like gestating by using like a swarm and then, then it kind of becomes one thing you've got all the Godzilla stuff and just i know this sets the bar pretty high but usually when you watch movies where characters are solving problems um like james bond movies or sherlock holmes stories the process of the character solving the problem is your meat of the entertainment that problem solving yeah. is what makes the character likable and you see the way they think about stuff and you can kind of usually you like the characters because they're charismatic and the script will be written in such a way that they come to a conclusion that is contrived so that you would not have thought of it yourself and you you and you're endeared to a character's intelligence yeah completely i that's why i thought godzilla 2000 was so good i know you didn't really care for the characters yourself but then they're night and day compared to this one. Yeah, even though there was a, it was really cartoony. But the villain of two thousand Katagiri, he's still yeah. a character. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit over the top. It's a bit kind of like, like I say, it's a bit cartoony the way he's so evil and like against like the other people. But at least there's a character here. Whereas in this movie, there's a scene where they're in Tokyo and Tokyo's become partially flooded because of like the Mega Gearus creature, and none of their electronics are working. And one of the characters just says, out of nowhere, maybe there's something underwater stopping our stuff working. Yeah, I was about to say that. He says, like, oh, maybe it's magnetism. And it's like, well, how does this he know is, is this his problem solving? Yeah, he, yeah, it was. he has no prior established knowledge that would say he would know about this. This is his area of expertise. There's no, like, you know, event that happens where it's like, oh, I'm thinking about this. Um, it's just... And also, it has no bearing on the rest of the movie. Only that one instance to kind of make him say, oh, there must be something underwater. Yes. And it's sort of like, where's that come from? So it becomes actively difficult to watch the movie, especially in the modern age where I'm sure you and I are both guilty of, like, your phone is, like, just there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you start looking at Twitter or something because the characters aren't engaging. It's like the rest of the movie is a pretty bog standard Godzilla story, but there's so much going on with the humans, which isn't engaging. It's like, you've got this thing with, um, you've got this thing with the Colonel. Uh, what's her name? I, I just pictured Colonel Sanders when you said no, that. Ki- Kiriko, right? Is that her name? Oh, Kiriko, yeah. Yeah, she should be quite interesting, but like her thing with like her dead like uh, oh, mentor is just like, he dies at the beginning in quite an exciting Godzilla scene where the rocket like yeah. flies past the camera and they do that match cut so like the scale is the same. That's really creative. But like we know that he wants she wants to avenge his death. And the story doesn't move anywhere until the end of the movie where, like, spoilers, she does. And it's like that was it. It was like literally like a a like A to B. He dies, she avenges him, it takes an hour and 40 minutes and there's nothing in between to fill that space yeah um you've got this like a, this scientist who in the dub has an australian accent and that's the only way i can remember who she is like what's her name i don't even remember which one the one in the oh yeah, the, the she, older one yeah she got an eye patch or something it was on my, my imagination no, I, think, I think it's just an american accent um well i i think but like her her kind of backstory is like her husband died or something yeah and it's in a like... previous thing and it's like she has that flashback and you're like oh okay i get it this happened, the g apparently. graspers are basically so, yeah. their entire motivation is they've lost someone to godzilla mm. which is like in in itself an interesting premise but it's just never executed correctly and you just you just don't care well it just doesn't it's just not interesting because like people get killed by godzilla all the time right <laughs> so they did that in um king of monsters okay recently you know with the with the dad, with the dad. Who i didn't like you we know did it in the brian Cranston Thanks. one his wife I su- died i suppose so yeah so it's a common he dies. premise yeah it happens all the time but you have to make those characters interesting in um godzilla the the 2014 one where brian Can- Cranston gets offed he's an interesting character because he's so obsessive about godzilla he seems to have mm. this deep understanding of what's really going on he's an exciting character in himself he's flawed and charismatic but you know i feel like it is very harsh for us to come out you know you know with the knives for this film straight off but there wasn't a single character in it who you could say i like spending time with them and if you haven't got that you haven't got a movie and i would extend that to mega gears themselves the flying creature because they don't pop up until an hour and 15 minutes in and the movie's an hour and 40 long, so you get, like, all this time with just, like, nothing really happening. To comment on the g Graspers, they did do one interesting thing. Did they? They seemed, <laughs> I don't know if they did, but they seemed to film it in a location 
that is very similar to, or maybe even the actual location that they used in the very first Godzilla movie, the 1950, 1956 one, because all the the brickwork of the G. Graspers headquarters is the same as the laboratory where the the uh, ox- oxygen secluder bomb is being developed in the first film, and the doors have this very um, notable brick archway, this circular archway over all the doors, and it's present in that first movie, and it's present in this movie. Is it? And did I you actually that's... go to compare it? Did you actually I, look? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're the same. I can't, I can't say that hallway is the same hallway, right. but I wonder if they deliberately picked a building or mimicked the sets so they can say, like, oh, these locations are the same, because um, Kiriko says, oh, this building was being disused, but it's our headquarters now, and I think if you're an eagle-eyed mm. Godzilla fan, they might be like a little like, oh, this building is the same one where the oxygen secluder, excluder, whatever that thing was called, yeah. uh, was being developed, because it's literally like the brickwork and the doors are the same and it's like a little subtle Mm. nod to go back to what you were saying about movies where they they're anti-godzilla anti-godzilla movies to me you can do one of two things either godzilla is going to be an all-out bastard villain and he needs to be gotten rid of because he's so vicious and dangerous and violent that you as an audience member want him gone Mm. Or the movie needs to play that trick where at the beginning you feel like, okay, they're going to kill off this creature, but you've come to sympathise with Godzilla along the way. And, um, you know, yeah, the, the 98 America one, the Matthew Broderick Godzilla movie, Godzilla does that, where Godzilla is a menace, but through Broderick's character you see like, oh, it's just a creature, we should protect it. Mm-hmm. And they do that story. And this movie doesn't do... Godzilla is neither a villain aside from at the beginning where he's basically just doing what comes actually to Godzilla. He's not notably antagonistic other than just being a massive creature. No. And then later on in the movie, he's again just like just doing his own thing. Because typically he is a character. Um, and if and if he's not, he's like a mechanism for delivering like a parable. Like I thought yeah. that's what this was going to be, like about renewable energy, like an like a environmental stance with it. But it didn't do even do those. And I'm not sure what the actual message of this movie was. Yeah, you've done quite a good job of, of pointing out the ideology of the previous Godzilla movies we've watched. And I don't know if there is one in this film. The Godzilla character is largely sidelined because you have human characters who, though free of charisma and personality, have these stories they have to complete. Mm. They don't really go anywhere, but you know they have to get to the end. Yeah. Um, and Godzilla's like largely not really in it so much and he doesn't really do anything to push the story forward so yeah yeah, yeah whatever I always felt like I was wanting more mm. and not in the sort of like oh, I wish that fight went on longer but as in it felt like it was teasing something that never actually happened so like a movie with a giant you know black hole gun wormholes and a city infested with prehistoric creatures sounds really exciting hmm but it is. It's, it is the hum- I suppose the human element that lets it down. And I worry we're going to end up repeating ourselves so often saying, oh, it's the humans that let this down. But This is the quintessential, I think. Yeah. The, out of all the Godzillas that we've watched, this is easily the, the top one for like the humans are the problem. Because, like I say, you get Godzilla stuff, but it's, it's well over an hour until the actual kaiju fighting starts. And any good Godzilla knows that they want to tease at least a little bit of kaiju one-on-one action sort of somewhere near the start. I mean, 2000 did that, where we had the UFO attacking Godzilla, so we had a little taste, even though it was still a long time until the actual conflict came. And that movie had good humans, so... I think they tried to do that with the Meganula. What, the little creatures? Yeah, it was teasing something. Well, yeah, it's not the same. That, I mean, what did, what did you think of Megaguirus, actually? Don't like Megaguirus, really, to be honest with you. The fight scene was heavy on compositing effects, like actual like f- effects that are made after the fact, post-production effects, and I like mm. seeing either full CGI fight scenes like we have in the new you know, you know, the new American series, which those are really good um, when, when they're edited properly, or I want to see guys in suits going hand to hand and because it's put they put stuff together you know after the fact using compositing i didn't really feel like we were actually seeing them fight yeah i mean it's it kind of straddles that line between practical effects miniatures and cgi Mm. and and like you say compositing as well but but yeah with really choppy results uh because i think with 2000 um godzilla 2000 even though 
they wanted to start using CG. It was used sparingly, mm. and even though you could see that's what it was, it was just used kind of in the correct correct places. But I think they really wanted to kind of go ham with it. Well, and they do they do CG in this movie to quite um, to good effect. In this, it's one. not necessarily that the CG is done badly. No. It's that fact you've got kind of three different streams of mm. making effects, and it kind of looks a bit. You can see the you know there's that gap that needs to be bridged and this is this is that movie where i feel like they're crossing over into a new era of making effects no, and i don't know if there, like maybe it's like no, a, it's an adolescent it. period yeah like the um when you did get the in the fight where you see them tussling in suits that's very kind of you know old school godzilla mm. fighting and i really liked that and that was i think that's where it shone but then the other parts, yeah, just kind of made it a bit meh. Yeah, it's the whole thing where he's like flying around and Godzilla's sort of like, where is he? And um, mm. the fight itself felt like it was aiming at a very young audience, I felt like. character. They made it much faster yeah. with Megaguirus being like kind of quick and zippy. It just felt like they were going for like a kind of comical, menacing sort of like... Um, it felt like the kind of fight scene that kids might enjoy more because it was more kind of like... There was more precociousness to it. Yeah, um, and it had that that kind of that wrestling move, the big body slam where he jumps up into the air and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I like all that, but that, yeah, that fun. I feel like that kind of fight scene, if they're going to aim for a younger audience, and it's worth pointing out that one of the key characters of this film is a very young child, then you want that fight scene to come pretty early in the movie, right? Because kids are going to get more, I would hope, more fidgety than us, even though we were really fidgety watching it. Mm. Um because it's so long until that fight scene comes. And, I mean, I don't think this is aimed at kids at all, because you have that part, I don't know, fairly early that on. horror bit. Yeah, with that couple that were going to get a beer. And it was like, this is like something in a Carpenter movie. Being the big horror fan that I am, mm. even though it's kind of a massive tonal shift, that kind of hooked me, and I was like, right, that's the kind of turn this movie's going to take. You and it... see more of that in, De- in Destroyer, don't you? Hmm... Not quite as gory. No, but I, this is the thing: is that I felt like that scene kind of started to set up a street level threat that I would have thought they would have developed on. But it, later in the movie, they flood Shibuya. Mm. I think it is, or is it um, Shinjuku? It is. No, it's Shibuya. Oh yeah, yeah, because they've got the one hundred and nine building, haven't they? Yeah. Um, so yeah, they flood that area, and it was like, well, now there's not going to be any street action, even though the whole flooding didn't really make much sense. But it, it might have been better for them to be like, well, we're gonna we're gonna run. A bit further with this street level horror before we get into the kaiju action and that would have been better but they just do like like you said they do this one kind of tonally odd like slasher death where the the, the script is i don't know if it's the dubbing the dialogue, the dialogue is hilarious is so do you want a beer yeah, yeah i love I a beer yeah a beer. great wait here okay <laughs> yeah it's just like it's literally like a kid wrote it um i think the um the actual acting for where it was probably the worst part as in the the dubbing actors and the way it's chopped together they needed to fit more into a sentence <sighs> and there's no no breath between the sentences which made it mm. it was like watching the room yeah. i think we're just picking up a, a part that's notably bad i mean generally the dubbing was it was okay yeah that, that, part that, was that part is especially horrendous bad. but i feel like I'm, I'm gonna go out on, on a limb um and having spoken to i don't i don't know a lot of japanese people but the handful of japanese people i've spoken to in life have often commented that acting in japanese movies is not great anyway and i felt like the mo- the acting of the actors themselves before the dubbing was not great no they have the kind of it's quite a romanticized acting i suppose but it feels like just like they're, they're aiming at a young a very very young audience yeah cuz it i couldn't decide if it was going to be like um like carpenter style gore fest mm. or like a Captain Scarlet esque adventure. It was very go like um, Thunderbirds. Yeah, like, like the music was like uncannily like. F-A-B. What I thought it was like. <laughs> well, I thought it was like um, like the Nintendo games, the Star Fox games. Oh right. And like, which is fairly well known to be based off shows like Thunderbirds. Mm. So I was like, oh, this is that whole kind of angle they're going for. But it, it was chopping and changing between the two, and I was just like, I'm not getting what they're trying to do here. Now this is where I feel like they maybe they had to different creative directions so with that kind of john williams-esque music i have a feeling that wasn't kind of the intention because you have that that gory moment and i think it was meant to be a bit more a bit darker in tone than it actually was and Mm. i have a feeling someone was like nah this is too much this is supposed to be yeah this is supposed to be a family Mm. movie 
But that's speculation. That's just the feeling I got is like it couldn't decide what it wanted to do. Movies like this do leave you to speculate though, because you have like you mentioned the room, which is like classically the most famous like bad bad movie. Mm. Um, but movies like that are fun to watch because they're so bad that they become intriguing in their own way. And obviously, we've got a good movie. You don't need to list any of those because you know what a good movie is. Everybody's got their own favourites. This movie falls right bang in the middle of it, like a mediocre film where you just like it doesn't really give you much to. It's very tepid. Yes, there was the one bit that I really enjoyed though, and I enjoyed it in a bad movie way. Was the the kids' adventure, and the kid sort of disappears from the entire movie towards the end, which is a shame. Um, yeah, because but... he kind of spurs on this theory with the Meganula and they're like alright cool got it thanks kid bye mm, they have this ridiculous thing where like they're testing this wormhole weapon the idea that they can it's a, fire well, the black hole gun yeah they can fire holes which is like such an amazing like stupid concept I, anyway I was going to ask you like what you thought about this <laughs> go on well I love it for how bad it is it's just like firing a hole and now I question <laughs> whether they're real scientists frankly because <laughs> they're like godzilla would... keeps destroying our city mm. so let's kill it with something that will consume the planet if we get it wrong and the thing is black holes they're hungry little things yes that's they're saying it was like two meters big you like we need to make it a bit smaller i was like that's you a, need to make it a shitload smaller than that yeah i'd like that's just gonna go straight to the center of the earth i think you're onto something that it might have been more fun if they were renegade scientists who are like, yeah. we've been told not to do this, but we're going to do it anyway. That would have been an but interesting But it's, it's an official, they're an official department. They're clutching at straws here, aren't they? Yeah, it was a bit weird. And like going to some random gadget shop where <laughs> Haj- Hajime works, it's like, we need you to work on black holes. It's I like, found this so... Hey? They go into this place and he's got this little bowl. <laughs> the little trick. He's doing a magic trick where the kids are like seeing a little katsu yeah. curry being made and they're like, wow, how is it done? And... The major comes in, uh, and she's like, oh, it's just little robots. And they're like, oh, just I was... just little robots? How boring. And it's like, little robots? Like, they were incredible. <laughs> I couldn't amazing. believe that was the disappointment, the fact that they're these tiny robots making food. I think they might be trying to, because the movie's set like in the near future, isn't it? I think it's meant to be set now, isn't it? Oh, sorry. Well, current time back then. Is it? I wonder if they're trying to characterise that to these kids. These robots are boring, and that's like wow. To them, it's like normal. But honestly, like I would feel like even in the future, they should have committed to this this idea more if they're in the future. Then, but yeah, the little kid. To go back to the black hole test. Right. <laughs> This little kid's just there. Like, they're firing this incredibly dangerous weapon. and not Such only... lax security. This little kid's there. The major realises that he's seen, and she just asks him, just asks him, could you keep this a secret, kid? And he's like, yeah. Can you imagine if, like, the government or, like, the nation of Japan found out that this woman just asked politely yep. for this kid to keep a secret? How absurd that would be. And she just gave him back his little box of bugs. And, and then walked away, was like, are you not going to escort him off at least? Yeah. It just didn't happen. And he has this egg. And then, then he comes <laughs> back again. He manages to get back onto the site, see the Meganula coming through the wormhole, get an egg, and then abscond again. It's like, how's, how's this happened a second time? Because there's no security, I guess. But why? Because <laughs> uh, movie has to happen. And then he's, then he's just conveniently in Tokyo, where they are also in Tokyo, like, doing their, like, Godzilla, anti-Godzilla stuff now, like, how how convenient. Um, and the egg's just, like, he just dumps it down a drain, and then the drain is, like, filling with water, and all these kind of, kind of like, these kind of ooh like, oh dear, kid moments where the kid's sort of, like, screwing up for, like, hiding the egg and, like, making things worse. Well, they were fun scenes, and I liked the, the idea that he was inadvertently, like, I've got to get rid of this egg and keeping this secret. And like, yeah. oh my God, it's just getting worse. And if that had been more of the movie and more humour from that, like, wow, this kid's getting like deeper and deeper into this problem. And he's like, it would have been great if the, if the creature had started to like gestate in his closet or something. And like in the E.T. or something where like <laughs> Elliot's got the alien in the closet and his mum's sort of like looking around. A well, scene like that. You could just watch E.T. Yeah, but <laughs> if you're going to rip off a movie, like at least rip off a good movie like E.T., right? And this film could have gotten away with like stealing a few more ideas because we've said before 2000 stole some dna from jurassic park and i think this one did too as well actually. i guess like all modern because it probably does mm. um but 2000 it was really overt i felt 
But all I mean is, like, they could have gone somewhere with the slasher thing that you mentioned. That would have been fun. They could have gone somewhere with this kid, like, trying to hide this creature in his house. And maybe his mum or, like, somebody, like, the neighbour could have got off to, like, a slasher scene. And he's like, oh, God, yeah. like, you know, getting a bit hot under the colour. Like, am I going to get, like, you know, convicted of murder or something? It would have been really fun. So there's definitely, like, there's some potential in the story that they just didn't use. Mm. That's, I guess that's just not the story they wanted to tell. No, I guess they thought no. the focus was elsewhere. Yeah. But because they kind of had these little tidbits of ideas and didn't really commit or execute any of them very well, it just felt for a very choppy experience. Yeah. Yeah. And now I wish it was that movie you just described. Oh, yeah. Well, there's something got to live movies, so we may yet see it. It may yet happen. It may. Yeah, absolutely. As much as we've kind of ragged on it, I do still get a level of enjoyment out of these movies, no matter how bad they can get. Mm. Um, I suppose, you know, for me, I think it was because coming off the back of Godzilla 2000, which I hadn't seen before, then seeing this, my expectations were actually really high, mm. which may have been my own downfall, really. But I mean, the the fight was really good. I enjoyed that. I mm. mean, that's the that's the part everyone was kind of waiting for. I didn't. Like but because it came yeah. because it came so late. I'd sort of lost interest. By yeah, that point. yeah, that's the thing is that you you you're not invested. The first no. hour and fifteen minutes does not keep you invested. So by the time the fight happens, it's just like I'm not emotionally tied to this. And I would argue that in King of Monsters, the last American one, the one that we started with on this on the show, that one didn't have me emotionally invested. Where as far as the fight was, was concerned, but because it was a big CG spectacle and we had these four creatures going at it, it had something. But the Mega Nula, like Mega Gearus monster. I just didn't like on a base level, so perhaps that's a bit subjective of me to say that I didn't like the fight, but just as a personal opinion, I, I didn't enjoy that. The best part of the movie in terms of action, like the Godzilla action scene that I liked was when um, Kiriko climbed on to Godzilla. Yeah, in the water. Yeah, and having a yes. person on Godzilla. I don't know if I've seen that before. That's, you know, I wrote the exact same thing in my notes. Like, has this ever happened before? Yeah, that was a really cool scene. I liked that. That was cool. It characterised her. She was like, I am not afraid to do this. And that gave her something to like to do. And I liked that. Um, So that, you know, empowered her a little bit. It didn't help the fact that she had no personality and the acting was bad. But Mm. it was like, oh, well, this character will like do this thing. I was like, okay, cool. Um, But that's kind of where it peaked. Yes, I think. And how fun would it have been to have her be on his back or something as the fight's going on? And she's like, oh my God, like, I really don't want to be here. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been really interesting, but it would have been very hard to pull off in the year 2000, I suppose. Perhaps. But something like that is that uh, they've, they've shown the idea, they've done it in this movie. Um, pretty sure they haven't done it before. Would happily see that done again to a greater extent. Um, mm. so yeah there's, there's still potential in having a human interact with Godzilla um, yeah, yeah I I wonder if the Megaguirus kaiju didn't really pay off because that's not the first time Mega Nulons have appeared really? Yeah, oh, I didn't, so didn't they, realise they were in the Rodan movie okay. quite prominently as the antagonist in that and that's why Rodan came about to fight them off oh. so I have a feeling for anyone who'd seen that, they'd be like, oh, it's these things. Oh, amazing. But then I think they were trying to subvert the expectation by going, hold on, guys. That he's not just going to fight Mega Nulons and it's going to be a big reveal. It'll be Mega Gearus, like a, a giant Mega Nulon. But I think that's kind of lost on us. Mega Gearus comes out of the wormhole, leaves an egg. No, right? not Mega Gearus. One of the, it's like a Mega Nulon. Okay, but it, it comes out of the wormhole, right? Yeah. But then they also find a fossil in China of it. Now, <laughs> so is this worth getting into? I think it, reasons? well, because it was a space time rift, and I feel like it traveled through time rather than oh. somewhere else. They um. don't really cut it, they don't really expand on it. It's only when I, I watched it a second time that I thought, oh, he must have come from the past. But I don't know how the giant cocoon got to the bottom of the flooded Shibuya, and where did that come from? I again, I watched it twice, and I just couldn't pick up how that appeared there. It all comes from one egg, I guess, which is like, this is a pretty powerful egg. Like, this egg is like a, a mega predator like thing. <laughs> so, that, or maybe we're missing something because I know, I know for sure that we both like lost our attention. This movie lost our attention at some point. But now, this is why certain. I'm wondering whether it was edited out in some way. 
I feel like there's something missing because there's there's another part where you know when um, the kid he meets up with Kiriko yeah. after he sees a Meganula flying around the sky. Yeah, and, and they like, talk about it pretty pretty casually, don't they? Yeah, she, she, but she's how pretty did unfazed. how did they know to meet? How did they even get in contact with each other? They just met up in this park yeah, and it's like movie. Yeah. Now this is it again. I feel like something was cut there, but I, I suppose because it was already running so long. Mm, I don't know. It's, I, I like long movies. Um, ben and I, we disagree yep. um, on this front. Ben is a very much concise movies are better. And I'm in the camp that if a movie is good, it can be as, as long as it wants to be. Some some movies are too long. Some movies say they're welcome. It's, it's just a fact of life. Then this movie, even though it's an hour and 45 minutes long, it's too long. Whereas I would happily watch mm. Return of the King. And I always watch the extended version and it's not too long. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, because... Everyone kind of has, yeah. I have exceptions to the rule. Like, yeah, if David yeah. Lynch put out another three-hour movie, I'd happily sit there and watch it, even if it, it was terrible. You know, I feel like we've kind of ripped it to pieces. I, I feel like we should be saying something more positive, but it's hard to say something positive about something that was just so lukewarm. Um, like, because it, it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> bad. That's the. I mean, in my opinion, it wasn't bad. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not going to give it. I'm not going to give it a pass. We don't really rate the movies. We don't give like five stars or anything. No. But if we did, we'd give I it would... two Meganula eggs out of five. <laughs> I would rate it pretty low, pretty low. So we always try to look at this as, um, like, can newcomers come into this film? I always think that's the the best way to kind of because if you judge a Godzilla movie by other movie standards, it's mm. it's never going to be quite right. So I kind of think, can a newcomer come and watch this and have a good time? I think someone could come and watch this and feel like they've not missed anything else, like yes. as in within the history of Godzilla, which is, I think, in itself a positive thing. But it's so all over the place, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, um, unless you're a hardcore Godzilla fan. Yeah, I would say this is a hardcore fans only, completionists only. If this was the first, <laughs> if this was the first uh, G Zilly movie I watched, I can say for an absolute certainty, I know myself, I would not go back for a second helping. Which, which is sad. It's sad. Mm, it's a shame. Yeah. Wasted yeah, effort. Yeah. This is the second one we've watched, uh, including King of Monsters, where we've had very few good things to say, which is a shame. I think we're often so critical as well because we are such fans of Godzilla, I think you tend to be more critical of things you really love because you want it, to, want it to be the best it can be, which is my issue with it. Yeah, and when you say, would you watch this as a, as a new fan? Obviously, mm. we would want people to have the best experience possible to, exactly. as a fresh movie. We can't say for sure. I can't say for sure that somebody going in blind to the series wouldn't really enjoy this. Maybe they would. But my advice would be don't. It's a, <laughs> it's a shame. Oh, well. On to yeah. the next one. Mm. Oh, right. Anything else to add, Graham? Skip this movie. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Um, so, where can the people find you, Graham? Well, other than Monster Island Radio, uh, I also do a YouTube show for retro video games and arcade classics. It's called Fossil Arcade. Um, so, if you're into video games, um, you can find Fossil Arcade on YouTube or at fossilarcade.com where you can also find uh, other episodes of this podcast. Please check it out. It's very, very good. Okay, so thank you for listening, everyone. Be sure to tune in next time on Monster Island Radio. Until next time, bye! bye.